so I was struck by something very specific when I was back there in prayer. One of the things that I love the most about God is that he can meet you exactly where you are. And I think sometimes in the Christian community, we believe that there's only one way to speak about something or you have to present a certain way for somebody to see the example. I would say the way God came and picked me up from the deepest, darkest parts of my life was not showing up with perfection. It wasn't showing up with a certain way of talking. It was meeting me exactly where I was through people that I was with, through experiences energetically that I had in my life. So what I want to pray over your life this morning is that you have an encounter with the Lord and that you remember that God can meet you exactly where you are. You don't have to come up here to be eligible for God to speak to you. God can speak to you at your deepest, darkest moment. He can speak to you at your highest height. He can speak to you through a homeless person on the street. He can speak to you through your best friend that's in a deep, dark place. Don't forget that. God can meet you anywhere. And I pray over your life today that God is able to meet you exactly where you are. Today we're talking about standing in power. I want you to just to think 20 seconds what you think standing in power means. Grab a visual. Come up with some words. What do you think it means to stand in power? Does anyone have an answer? Gordon, can we get the other microphone turned on and Tiffany, can you pass it to whoever we call in? So I don't have my good enough glass on, but let's go all the way in the back. Sorry, I'm really putting my husband on the spot here this morning. So Tiffany, all the way in the back here this way. This way, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to call on a few different people because I want to see what people are seeing for standing in power. Okay, what do you, is that Marie? It's more just like, I guess, like knowing that you're in your own strength and that you can go farther in your own, like, visualization, how you see things and what you can go farther in with the spirit of the Lord. Okay, let's pass that this way. (laughs) Katie, grab that mic, girl. Okay, so like the first thing that popped to mind when I when you said standing in power was like a superhero just like on a cliff, just like like Thor or something, just like ah. So like physically yeah. strong. Yeah, and then when powerful. I obviously that was just like the first thing, but like to me, like standing in power is like standing in Christ. Like Christ is your power, and I mean, like when you're standing, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just like you're standing in Christ, Christ is your power, you know, you have power. So Christ, Christ is within you and that's where the power is coming yeah. from? Yeah. Okay, well done. Let's go on the, all the back there, back right. Um, Not letting, like, the things that are trying to pull you away from God pull you away. Yes. Mm, I like that. Let's grab one more. So the verse that kept on coming through my head this morning during worship was trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. So the fact that this is the question that you're kind of presenting to us feels very significant of how often we can delay ourselves because we are trying to do things our way Mm -hmm. rather than allowing spirit to move through us. So yeah, kind of just like piggy piggybacking off of what everyone else said today is like standing in Christ. So not standing in your own power, but on power that comes from something else, correct? Okay, let's dig in. We're going to open with Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That sounds like the kind of power I want. Do you guys want power to tread on serpents and scorpions and not get hurt? So in our life, what could be a few things that act as serpents or scorpions? Think about a couple things that might stand in your way to create pain or trauma in your life. Might those be serpents and scorpions? So when we know how to stand in power and authority in Jesus, things that might hurt and damage somebody else, if you're standing in the right power with the right authority, you can actually get through that situation unscathed. 
So in multiple verses, we also hear that people, you can have the enemy shoot darts at you and they just fly right by, right? You're, you're in the battle, you're in the part that looks like it should be scary, but you are taught how to stand in power, in authority, because this battle is actually happening spiritually, not physically. So one of the things that has always frustrated me is the lack of understanding of the spiritual battle. Can anyone really give me like a one sentence summary of what's happening in, in the spirit right now? Other than angel. But if it has to go an angel, then it has to go an angel. <laughs> yep, let's get the mic to her. Today's gonna be interactive, so let's just keep that mic on the ready. So this is something that I'm working a lot in therapy right now. Um, Basically, it's like where the parts of you that are trying to destroy you and like my emotional addiction cycles and things like that are coming at me and it's attacking my spirit and wanting to be in charge. But the spiritual battle is when my governor or like the person, my spirit is fighting those other parts of me that are attacking each other and just trying to um, be in control of my actions in my life. Ooh, well stated. That was awesome. So maybe the easiest way to pull out of that and make it something that's relevant to everybody is that when we're talking about a spiritual battle, we're talking about a battle between the enemy or the dark kingdom and all of us here, right? So a lot of times we're in our lives thinking about a fight that's taking place or some sort of stressor that we have in our life. And the enemy wants us tricked into only seeing that three-dimensionally, right? We only want to see the fight that's taking place right now in the physical. I don't believe enough people have been equipped in Christ to understand what's happening from a higher level, right? We're told multiple times, this is not a battle of flesh. This is a battle in the spirit. So I think it's pretty important that we understand how to fight a battle in the spirit, don't you? If that's what's happening. So I want you to think for a moment. Some of you were raised in the church. Some of you have strayed from the church. Maybe come back. Maybe strayed again. Maybe come back a little bit more. Maybe unsure. I want you to ask yourself, do you actually know who you are? We've been talking about a message sequentially. We even talked about understanding the transaction of salvation a couple weeks ago. I want you to think for a moment who actually are you as a spiritual being? Come up with that in your head for a moment. And do you actually know what authority you have? Would you be able to describe that to me? So I want you to think for a moment about a job, right? Let's say you get offered a job. Are you going to be able to do well in that job if you're not given a job description or some sort of expectation for the job? Would you be potentially set up for failure by showing up and not actually knowing what to do? So I look at this as you have a clear job to do here, right? Every single one of us does. We owe it to ourselves to go seek out the job description, right? Like if this is a spiritual battle and we've all been called to be on the battlefield for this time, we need to understand what the job is, how to do it, what the rules of operations are, right? If you started a company, typically you get an employee handbook. A lot of times we get Bible verses that preach well on a Sunday without really getting the operating manual. I think you all deserve the operating manual because that's how we actually stand in power and authority and navigate through this life. This is a fallen realm. Doing what you can to keep chasing happiness, is that ever gonna really turn out well for you if that's your primary goal is to chase happiness? Have any of you in this audience chased happiness? chased pleasure, chased what you want. Does that ever actually work? If we switch to chasing purpose and mission, might we be more fortified to handle the potential scorpions and serpents that stand in our path, right? If we know what the battle is and what we are called to do in it specifically, we know exactly the operating manual to navigate. But a lot of us don't know what authority we have or what job we're in. And do you understand how this world operates? I know some of you learned a little bit about this with me about six months ago, and we're gonna dig into it again at the end of January. Understanding 
how the spirit realm works and how that interacts with our day-to-day -day life, our thoughts, our relationships, our desires to step into mission, that's kind of everything. Without understanding that piece, a lot of the Bible doesn't really make sense. Once you understand the spiritual laws in the Bible, a lot of the things that sound either mean or metaphorical start to make a lot of sense. Has anyone ever run into that where certain parts of the Bible really hit home and you're like, yeah, that makes sense to me. That seems practical. And then you get to another part and you're like, I don't know, way over my head. I don't know what just happened. Has that happened to anyone? There is a way to pull out a baseline of understanding, right? So when you understand what's happening in the spirit realm and what's happening in this spiritual battle, it gives you context to fit into the whole story that makes even the metaphors make sense. Wouldn't that be nice if even the parts that seemed metaphorical and weird all of a sudden click together? Because the, the Bible is meant to be consumed as a whole. And we've talked about this before. I love how the Bible, every single word in it, can become brand new. I can be at a different phase of my life, be in a different season, go back to the same scripture and all of a sudden different revelation than I ever had before. So the Bible is able to be a living, breathing document to move with us through our life, but we have to understand the spiritual battle. So I want you to think for a moment what role you are playing in this spiritual battle. What is your position on the battlefield? Are you busy chasing happiness and some sort of physical transaction to make you feel better when really you're actually missing the whole point of being here? Do any of you think that maybe you're missing the battle? I like that hand raised. I also like seeing you here today. Let's look at Ephesians 3.16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. What do we think the inner man is? Anyone? So I want you to think for a moment about a time that you might have been having a conversation with somebody. Maybe you're upset and you said something that you probably shouldn't have said and you actually catch yourself listening to it at the same time being like, oh, that was pretty mean. I shouldn't have said that. Has anyone ever had that experience where they're both talking and observing same Z's? Same time? Okay. So let's take a look for a moment and say maybe, and I believe that's just the start of it, but let's say that perhaps that inner observer is at least the beginning point of the inner man, right? Inner wool man, inner man, inner person. So we have ourselves, right? Our physicality, our voice, our personality. And then we have a spirit man, right? There's a part of us, a piece of us that is living a spiritual life on a plane that is not physical, right? Like this is, that's physical. There's also an immaterial plane and that is where the spiritual battle is taking place. That immaterial plane can influence our thoughts, it can influence our choices, and this is really where they say that the enemy comes prowling looking for souls to devour. If we're operating in our physical brokenness, the enemy can just pop right in there and pop in an intrusive thought that's gonna make you take an action you'll later regret. We have to understand that most of what we experience, most of what is manipulating our mind and our choices, it's happening in the spirit realm. So here, we need to strengthen our inner man, not our outer man. How many people go try to, you know, let's look at this for a moment. Every time I go down this road, I keep thinking of people that try to work out more, control things through looking pretty, right? Like get physical, um, like plastic surgery and things like that. In our world, to become powerful, people try to look pretty. They try to look fit. They're working on the wrong part, right? That's not real power. That's something else entirely. So have you ever accidentally gone seeking something physical to feel powerful instead of go inside? When we are truly allowing God to transform us and stand in our power, we have to be focused on the spirit man, not the physical, right? So a lot of times people that might even look 
kind of meek and quiet, they might be really powerful in the spirit. I want you to be conscientious of how your mind, right, and even the enemy through your mind is getting you tricked into looking outside of yourself to become powerful instead of letting God transform the innermost part of yourself to become powerful. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So infirmities are like weaknesses. So what we're talking about here is that a lot of us try to hide the worst parts of ourselves. Have any of you done that? You get kind of ashamed of a part of yourself, then you start to compartmentalize, shut down. You put on a facade. You know that, like, Ugh, that's not a part of myself I can really show to these people. What God is saying here is that actually, when you openly acknowledge where you are weak, you openly acknowledge where there is work to be done, what can God then do? God can work through to actually let that be some of your power. One of the things that came to mind when I read this verse is often those who go through some of the worst traumas end up eventually being led to teach other people how to navigate through those traumas. Oftentimes, God uses the parts of our life that we feel would be so guilty or shameful to actually help transform other people. So by way of the lifestyle that some of you have had to live up to this point, I'm encouraging you right now, don't let that change who you think you can be in God. God can use any person on the planet, regardless of what you've been through, regardless of what traumas you've experienced, regardless of what choices you've made. If you shift and allow that inner man to be transformed, God can use every terrible thing that's ever happened to you, not just for your good, but for his good. So anyone here that is holding on to some sort of shame about I can't be used, what I've done is too bad, I just ask that you ask God to let that go now. That has no place in your life. That has no place in your spirit. We know that God transforms us in weakness as long as we don't hide from it. So I want everyone to close your eyes for a moment. If you want God... to transform that in you, that you stop hiding and that you stop pretending that it's not there and you actually want God to see it and restore it and transform it in his name, I want you to put your hand up now. God can do that for you, but you have to be willing to put it up there. You've got to stop hiding. You've got to stop pretending. Let's shift into Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall wit be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Walking with the Holy Spirit can look completely crazy. Boom. That's the whole sermon right there. Has anyone ever felt like they look like a complete Looney Tune trying to walk with the Holy Spirit? Okay, is the Holy Spirit's path for your life typically linear? Does it always make sense or ever make sense to people around you? So might it be true that when we are allowing ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit, we might look kind of crazy and maybe not that powerful to the outside world? So in order for us to be able to handle that, we have to be really clear on who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Otherwise, are we going to fall victim to peer pressure? How many of you have been trying to walk something out with Holy Spirit only to then crumble when one person judges you or makes you question it? That is what God is calling you here right now to learn how to do. The world, who's seen The Matrix? I'm a backup. Really? 
Only, come on. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. I'm gonna give you a chance to wake up. Who's seen The Matrix? Raise your hand. Listen, youngins, you have some movie watching to do. I'm embarrassed. I feel old. I don't usually feel old, but I just officially started feeling old. Okay, so in The Matrix, God, how do you summarize The Matrix? Okay, so there's a group of people living life, and they all think that they're just living life, and a few people in this movie start to realize that there's clearly something else going on, and these people are living let's just say is something that's more like a video game, right? They think that they're real people le leading real lives, but really it turns out they're basically in a simulation, okay? You're following me? Great. There is a specific character called Agent Smith. He's kind of like, imagine like a Secret Service-y type of guy, earpiece in. And this Agent Smith kind of polices anyone that starts to realize that they're actually in a simulation because once somebody says it, it's kind of infectious, right? Once somebody shares something truthful with you that you've never known before, does it kind of make you shift your whole reality? Has that ever happened? Where it's like one person drops in one thing where you're like, oh God, I call that reality vertigo, where all of a sudden your whole perspective of reality shifts and then it kind of feels like you're falling and you need to recalibrate. That is why Agent Smith protects the matrix, right? He's trying to keep people trapped there and they can't really know the truth, otherwise they're all gonna start to push against it. Here's where I'm going with it. When you are standing in power with authority, right? Like not knowing, not just knowing who you are and what you're capable of, but actually that you have legal rights to do what it is that you're about to do, you're going to agitate the agent smiths of the world. Right? When you're actually showing up, ready to do God's work, everyone that doesn't want to wake up, everyone that the enemy has direct access to to start to be his mouthpiece will start to push against you. And if you don't know how to withstand peer pressure, are you going to get very far? So I would say one of the best things that we can do as Christians that are aware of the spiritual battle that we're currently living in, is to really fortify ourselves against peer pressure. I would say the world we live in right now has extreme peer pressure. Anyone ever heard of cancel culture? Being yeah, being canceled. Have you ever been canceled? Yeah, I'm same girl, same. <laughs> I've been canceled a lot. And I'm, and I'm still here. So here's the thing. And I believe God did this to me in a specific season of my life so that I could learn not to be scared anymore. Sometimes my nature is to be a peacekeeper. My nature is to try to smooth everything over to keep the peace and be stable. Am I going to be able to do that and walk with the Lord? Am I going to be able to try to make everything like warm and fuzzy for everybody while I'm actually doing what God's asking me to do? Absolutely not. It could never work. I, by nature of standing in power with authority, allowing Holy Spirit to lead me, will ruffle feathers. Believe me, it has already happened. So I'm no different. You will ruffle feathers too. Jesus even says to his disciples, only follow me if you hate your wife and children because everybody's going to become an outcast. So what I'm saying here is, the agent smiths in your life are going to do everything they can to be like, are you sure? Are you sure that's a good idea? Are you sure that's what you should be doing? <laughs> and you're canceled. You've got to be willing. I can't even see what happened. It sounds like you. I'm going to need you to take radical ownership here. God saw that. God, can I get a tape rollback? Yeah, definitely you. No, I don't cancel anybody. Here's the thing. Does anyone feel like the moment in time we're at right now, and I know it's hard for some of you because y'all are so little, so young, big, big spirits, but little. Yeah, you're 16. That's little. I'm so much older than you. 
I'm about to turn 38. Thank you. I feel so much better now. No, I'm about to be 38. I've got four kids. No Botox for now. I just really. <laughs> okay. So here's where we're going to bring this back to. It's a little bit easier for me at 38 to reflect on 38 years and been like, you know, this point in time that we're at is it's pretty weird. Right, like my first decade, second decade, they were all like pretty like, okay, like culture changes a little bit, but culture doesn't completely change. What you all are having to deal with in the last five years is what? Like, <laughs> did you just say racism? Okay. <laughs> well, that's still, it's part of it for sure, right? A complete cultural upheaval a complete, in many ways, 180. Where before, culture will shift maybe 2%, 2%, 2%, right? Until eventually there's something very noticeable. That's often how it happens, right? Is it changes so small that we don't really notice it until all of a sudden, like, bell bottoms aren't in anymore, right? Can I tell you how long I fought skinny jeans? I fought skinny jeans almost until they were not cool anymore. I got maybe one year of skinny jeans before bell bottoms came back. What culture is doing right now, at this moment, it's no longer 2% shifts. It's like one day it's skinny jeans, one day it's bell bottoms, one day it's mom jeans, right? Just imagine complete shifts. And I'm talking to you in fashion here because y'all are teenagers. When you shift that rapidly in a day, it becomes really hard to know who you are and how to operate, right? Does that potentially make the fear of peer pressure worse when you're genuinely not understanding how to fit in or how fast the rules can change? This is how the enemy works. So this moment in time that we were in, not were, I guess we were two seconds ago, that we are in, I believe the spiritual battle is intensifying to a level that we haven't felt yet on this earth. So. You're young, so it's a little bit harder to see it from the perspective that I see it, but have any of you felt that shift over the last few years? Does it feel like we're reaching a, a tipping point or a threshold crossing spiritually? So I encourage you, this is the time to become equipped. Sometimes based on the life that some of you are living right now, it's really easy to get kind of sucked into where you feel trapped, stuck, or powerless in your life. This is temporary. I know it might feel like it's taking forever, this is still temporary. I encourage you to be working on, in the background, some of these other things that you can carry with you for the rest of your life. Not just let your present circumstance be a reason that you check out and stop caring about what's actually taking place. So walking with the Holy Spirit requires you to actually truly give your life to him. It is really challenging to try to walk with Holy Spirit when you're one foot in, one foot out. Your life will constantly look like a pendulum swing. I encourage you, go all in. What do you really have to lose? Do you really have anything to lose at this point in your life? Go all in and watch how God will transform you. But I'm telling you right now, the enemy will push against every single thing that you do, and you have to be fortified and clear on what your job is, okay? So I want to take a look at these two things before we wrap up today. So in general, people tend to think that strength comes in all the things on the left. And what I want you to leave here today knowing is that really what God sees as strength is very different. So what you typically think strength is, is being fearless or courageous, right? And I'm not saying being fearless or courageous is a bad thing, but you can be completely scared and still being led by Holy Spirit. I've, been, I've had to do some things that Holy Spirit's asked me to do where I'm completely scared the whole time, I'm just still doing them. So strength isn't just being fearless. Strength isn't just putting on a tough facade because often what's underneath the tough facade is probably an inner man that's not at all fortified, somebody that doesn't know who they are in God. 
a lot of people think that strength is being the best at something, right? Are any of you kind of competitive? I'm very competitive. A lot of times, the way God is helping you walk out your mission, you will not be the best. You will not necessarily be the winner because the world typically chooses the winner. The world will elevate the best, right? I truly believe in today's landscape on social media, people that get elevated rapidly, they're typically not actually doing God's work. The world is elevating them. The algorithm is elevating them. So for some of the people out there that are listening to this today, if you've been working so hard, doing everything God asked you to do, and you're not going viral every single day, you're probably doing something right. The world and the enemy make things go viral, right? If that message is picking up with people and it's picking up steam, it's probably not God. But it doesn't mean God can't do that. But in general, if you look at that landscape, being the winner of the world is probably not actually walking in true power with the Lord. Obviously, physical attributes, that's not it. Success in the world. And here's another one that I think is interesting to look at, being the leader or controlling a situation. A lot of times, God is having you step back. God is having you support. Being powerful in God doesn't mean that you have to be in charge. It doesn't mean that you have to be trying to control your outcome. So what God says strength is, is understanding this is a spiritual battle. I hope that at the bare minimum, you leave today with that. Knowing that you have power and authority, not hiding your flaws or sin and making sure that you're seeking repentance. We have talked about this before. Repentance is shifting your mind and saying, God, I, I can see that this isn't right. I want to change. This isn't having to get down on your knees and put your hands up and saying a certain type of prayer, repentance should happen throughout the day. Anytime you catch yourself doing something, saying something, thinking something you shouldn't be thinking that's not actually serving you, boom, repent right then and there. Strengthening your inner man and letting the Holy Spirit guide you. And believe me when I say that is challenging because the world will all turn Agent Smith on you. So I will make sure that you all get a copy of this. I want you to sit with these questions over the week. I think each of, God gave me each of these questions more for you to meditate, journal, spend some time really thinking about, because I think God's trying to show you areas of your life where transformation needs to occur. So I want you to ask yourself these questions and pray for God to reveal where you have to dig in and ultimately remember who you are. I believe that you come here for a moment, remembering who you are, and then slowly the world starts to pattern you and you forget, right? You become almost amnesia. We need to get you to remember who you actually are in God and that the enemy can't mess with you when you know who you are and how to operate in this world. So question one, am I standing in power or am I sitting down? If you're sitting on the battlefield, are you gonna be very successful? Like if someone just popped on the battlefield and pulled up like a lawn chair with a beer, is that really going to do much? Probably not. Do I need to prioritize understanding the spiritual battle and my role in it? As I said, a lot of churches don't dig deep on understanding the spiritual laws of battle. I encourage you to dig into that. Have I been intentionally scared away or shamed for asking questions about this? And has this been hidden by past churches or church leaders? Some of these concepts, I believe a lot of church leaders avoid having to talk about because in the past, so many of these topics end up being linked to like demons and evil spirits, right? To me, that's just operating in fear. If you don't know how to have these conversations that are all 100% biblical, you're kind of hiding information because you don't want it to be taken out of context. To me, that kind of goes back to bowing down to the world and hiding crucial information that God's people need. So instead of not wanting to upset people, which sounds like caving to peer pressure, we need people to be equipped. What previous teaching needs God to bring forth revelation and restoration? 
Am I letting the world trick me into seeking worldly power that will never help me in the spirit? Am I prioritizing my relationship with Holy Spirit and allowing myself to be led even when it feels crazy? And it will. For those of you that tend to have control issues in your life, being led by Holy Spirit is going to be doubly hard because you have to be able to surrender and trust that actually God is going to show up for you. I know for some of you, when I've taught you a different lecture, I talked about how if you've ever had a parent show up late for school or just kind of like forget you and roll in an hour later, a lot of times when we're thinking about letting Holy Spirit guide us, there, that part of our brain that feels like God's going to somehow ditch us or not show up to pick us up at school gets activated. That's where the work needs to be done, right? We, we can't doubt God like that and expect to walk this out. Am I acknowledging the areas of brokenness that require repentance, or am I hiding in self-deception? You guys have to own this stuff. If you truly acknowledge it, take radical personal responsibility and actually give it openly and up to God, he can transform it. If you're hiding from yourself in self-deception, you're not letting him work in you yet. Am I running away from areas of life that God has called me into out of fear or control? Many times the enemy will attack you most in the area that you've actually been called to for your mission. Some of the areas where I've experienced the most intense backlash and attack are the areas that God's called me to in my purpose. So the enemy, think about it like a minefield. The enemy will like put a minefield exactly where it is that you're supposed to go because the enemy doesn't want you to get there, and God knows that if you keep pushing through that minefield, you'll be fortified enough to handle the job on the other side. Do I need God to shift my perception of what a good Christian looks like? Is this something that's been holding me back? I'm not going to dig too much on that one, but I think some of you know what I mean by that. God, what is my assignment, and is there any way my human mind or emotions are blocking what you want for me? I think this is really the key that I want everyone leaving with. Start praying to God, what is your assignment right now? What do you want me to be doing with my life? I don't know about you, but that's something that I pretty consistently go into prayer with God about. God, what do you want me to do? Your words, not my words. Your thoughts, not my thoughts. The more you pray that and the more you actually ask God to reveal to you that which you should be doing, the better life is going to get, I assure you. So let's wrap this up with a prayer. Let's all close eyes for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this time and place. Thank you for these people. Thank you for giving us power and authority to navigate through this life, to step fully into the mission that you've called each and every one of us to. God, I ask that you help reveal that assignment on each person's life, that you break away any guilt or shame holding people back from stepping into their identity in you. God, I ask that you help each of these people in the audience carve out time to spend one-on-one -on -one with you that you call them back to these questions and that by the end of the week, every single one of these questions has deep revelation. God, I ask that each person here leave this room today knowing exactly who they are, that none of this is by accident, and that they have a place on this battlefield. Their place isn't on the sidelines. Their place isn't crumpled in a corner crying about how unfair life is. God, I ask that you transform each person in this room through all of their trauma, all of their heartbreaks, and you call them into deep restoration and help them realize that they are here to help restore others. God, I pray health and safety for everyone in this room, and that everyone have a wonderful week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, we will see you next week. Feel free to jump in on some more food. We'll see you next time.